CNN's Ron Israel has a report. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Seven Americans were on board when the space shuttle Challenger lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center. The crew members included three trained pilots, a laser expert, the second woman to fly in space, a Hughes aircraft engineer, and Krista McAuliffe, the woman who was to have been the first teacher in space. Challenger's pilot was 40-year-old Michael Smith. He flew missions in Vietnam and was awarded the Navy's Distinguished Flying Cross. He said flying was a dream he had since guess, childhood. Uh, you know, as far back as I can remember, all I ever wanted to do was fly. And, and when I was a, a young uh, kid coming up, of course, the space program was just getting started. And my interest just naturally uh, from the flying aspects went over uh, to wanting to fly into space. And it's just something that I've wanted to do all my life. And I, I don't know how I got interested. I can't tell you. I just have always been been interested in, in, uh, in doing flying. The flight was commanded by 46-year-old Francis Dick Scobie. The Challenger flight was going to be his second trip aboard the space shuttle. Scobie was a test pilot with the Air Force. He entered the space program in 1979, and he believed Krista McAuliffe would serve as an important role model for part, younger Americans. The lasting part, the lasting part is going to be the, the, the idea that, that, that she puts in the head of, the, of both teachers and, and students to expect to be in space. In other words, their future, it, space is part of their future. They expect to live and work there. And if she can do that, she's doing a lot for mankind. Mission specialist Ellison Onizuka was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He was a member of the crew of the Defense Department's first super secret you know, shuttle I, flight. I, you know, I think that there is a need for, you know, what we did on our first mission. Uh, and I fully believe that, that, you know, it's something that this country needed the rest of the free world needed it. Dr. Judy Resnick was a biomedical engineer before joining the space program in 1978. She said Krista McAuliffe became a part of the team even though she was not a trained astronaut. She knows where we're going to be standing, how busy it's going to be, um, where she can help, where, where we, we need our space, and she has learned an awful lot and become a team member. Payload specialist Gregory Jarvis was an electrical engineer who joined the program only two years ago. He talked about the space vehicle. Well, it's been very satisfying because you are close to the space. You, you don't get to do the ultimate trip, but you're close enough to the program that you really feel like you're contributing. And you, you bring your friends in to see the spacecraft and they look at it and you say, gee, I wonder, you know, maybe it is something special because I spent all my life around it, so it becomes very mundane to me. Finally, 36-year-old mission specialist Ronald McNair was a physicist. He became an astronaut in 1978 following work at the Hughes Research Laboratories. McNair planned to track Holly's Comet during the Challenger mission. Probably everything we know about it we're going to learn during this trip. We're going to learn something about some of the, the gases and elements that the comet are composed of. What does that tell us? Well, that comet exists now the way it did the creation, origin of the universe. McNair was the second black astronaut to fly in space. Ron Israel, CNN. In that interview, one couldn't help but notice the bold red letters of the logo, the logo, I should say, of NASA. You saw it there in the beige uh, background there. And this agency will be speaking officially very shortly. We had told you that the briefing at 3.30 had been pushed back to 4. It's running a little bit late. That's certainly understandable. And when they are ready to give us the latest on this, of course, your network of record will bring it to you live. President Reagan, deeply shocked, concerned over today's tragedy, calling it traumatic for the nation, as well as for himself personally. He was interrupted during a briefing for reporters on tonight's State of the Union address to learn the sad news. Shortly after seeing for himself in a videotape replay, Mr. Reagan wasted no time in revamping his schedule. Due to the tragedy of Space Shuttle Mission 51L, the President, in consultation with the leadership of Congress, has decided to postpone the State of the Union address that was scheduled for this evening. He will address the Congress and the American people on next Tuesday. That is the State of the Union address to come next week, but President Reagan will speak to the nation about an hour from now. We're told at 5 o'clock Eastern time, and that's about 54 minutes from now. And, of course, CNN will carry it live. First Lady Nancy Reagan was watching the Challenger liftoff on CNN. 
A response after that explosion? Oh, my God, no. Mrs. Reagan's spokeswoman said the First Lady is in shock and grief for the families. House Speaker Tip O'Neill, among many in Congress, reacting to this tragedy. Sometimes an event strikes us with such a drama and surprise that it exceeds our ability to absorb it. This is what happened today in the terrible destruction of our country's space shuttle. The space shuttle carried on its side the flag of the United States, the American people. They served our hopes for a scientific exploration and for human progress. But they also served our dreams because they lived at the frontier of what mankind can achieve together. And generally, the House of Representatives today put aside regular business to pay tribute to the seven brave Americans. With hearts uh, heavy in trauma and deeply felt sorrow, the nation today pays honor and tribute to these brave young Americans and extends its hand to their families, and their loved ones, and their comrades in such small ways as we can. We've come to accept these flights as being so routine, and yet it's so highly sophisticated, highly so technological in nature that any little thing can go wrong. Remind me again of how mysteriously or God moves in mysterious ways. I guess from time to time to remind us of what mortal beings we really are. And on the other side of the Capitol building, several senators took exception to questions about whether NASA was getting lax about safety. I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that someday there would be a a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. Safety has always been uh, foremost in their minds. And we woke up on Sunday morning after having canceled at 10 o'clock the night before to a perfect morning. <clears throat> it was beautiful, sunny, clear blue skies, perfect launch, and there was a lot of talk that rather irritated me while well, NASA was overly cautious. And so, no, I don't think that's true at all. And the House of Representatives says it will conduct an investigation of the accident when NASA finishes its own investigation. And my apology to the man you're about to see next, I introduced him as Lou Dobbs. It's really Lou Waters in Atlanta. All right, Bernie, a banner was unfurled this morning at Concord High School. It read, Concord is proud of Krista McCullough. But the party atmosphere turned to horror as students and teachers watched the shuttle Challenger disintegrate in a ball of flames. There was dead silence, then tears at Concord High School. A teacher turned off the television set the students were staring at. The stunned children were ushered into classrooms while the teachers called their parents. Then. The school day was cut short at Concord High as the students made their way home, crying. Some were shaking. Dozens of balloons that were to be released when Krista McCullough broadcast her first class in space sit in storage. It was just back in July that a bubbly, enthusiastic Krista McCullough spoke with reporters after being chosen to be the first civilian in space. The training will start um, in September. Did you think that you were ever going to fail in any part of the testing? Um, no, that wasn't really part of the evaluation process. So even if I had gotten sick on it, I would, I'd still be all right. Were you surprised by the testing or anything? Did you think it was harder than... The intensity of it, just lots and lots of things crammed into a week. I mean, we were just running from early in the morning to late at night. Do you think that was part of the training or the testing? Well, maybe, but I think they were also, they knew that we only had the, us for a short period of time. They were just trying to cram as much as possible so that we could really experience everything that we could in that, that short period of time. John said today you were going to take one of his pet frogs along on the flight. Is that going to be one of the pieces of the car? Yes, we're going to put that frog right on the shuttle. This is... Scott? This is Scott. Okay. Scott, does the frog, does the frog have a name? 
Yep. Legal. 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 The frog is going to go into space. Yes. That's part of the deal. Did NASA know about this? I have. I do have a personal compartment on board the shuttle. I can't take some things along with me. I'm not big enough for any of you, but. Good actress, have you seen the inside? You must have yeah. seen the inside yeah. of one of these things. Yeah. A personal compartment. Yeah. How yeah. comfortable it's, it's is it? It's probably about this big and about that size, so that you can bring some of the some things that you you know you like to wear. Yeah. Kind of T-shirts you're going to wear. Like what kind of T-shirt are you going to wear? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to get a good New Hampshire one. Can you tell us about the camaraderie between you and the other nine finalists? Oh, it's just wonderful. It really is. I mean, we went through so much. And all I can liken it to is um, having a, a small bunch of people kiss kisses. <laughs> Kristen, <laughs> finally, what's it like? <laughs> We're sitting up. <laughs> oh, she's resting? Oh, who's with her? Now it's 20 seconds. A long 20 seconds. Is this like a countdown? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Dion, Kristen is here with me now. She just got off the plane a while ago, and I know that you were chosen for this mission partly because of your disposition. You've been giggling since you got here. Tell me why, again, you've said it so many times, why is this so important to you, making this trip on the show? Well, it's important for a lot of reasons, but I think the most important thing is to humanize the space age to a point where everybody feels a part of it, and the students really connect with that. They're the wave of the future. They're the ones who are going to have to deal with the space stations and beyond, and I really hope and feel that it's part of the teaching profession to bring those new clear opportunities. I know, it's wonderful. Okay, all right, so how's it feel to be back in New Hampshire? It feels great to be home. I am really delighted because I kept hearing about all of these wonderful things that people were doing while I was down in Washington, while I was down in Houston, and I couldn't share with that. Yeah. You know, and Steve would tell me on the phone, and he'd say, you know, you got some letters, or, you know, people called, and, and I couldn't share with that, so I'm really glad I'm home. How long are you going to be home for? Well, hopefully I'll be home on and off for about a month, so I'll, I'll be able to spend some time in New Hampshire. Yeah. I gotta ask you, when did you find out? Did you find out just before the announcement, or? Yeah, we did. We asked as a group, um, we requested that we find out prior to going into the room. It was a small room. There were a lot of press there. We've invested an awful lot of emotion in these last two weeks, and we really felt that we needed to find out and compose ourselves before walking into the room. So we did, we did know when, before we walked in. <laughs> what were your feelings when you found out? <laughs> well, it was, it was rather funny when, when we were talking about um, uh, what was happening at home, and, and I was saying something to the effect that, you know, well, you know, when I'm not home, and, and I said, my husband really relies on cornflakes and milk, because that's kind of his staple. <laughs> and Ann Bradley turned around and kind of, not, without missing a beat, she turned around and she said to me, while the whole group was together, she said, I think you better buy some more cornflakes and milk. <laughs>